peace of the Lord to everyone in Jesus' name. I greet you all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How time flies. I, today is 31st of October 2023 already. I know that in the past few days we have been coming here every morning and evening to listen to the undiluted word of God. The, the man of God has admonished us with the rest scriptures from the Bible. We have heard them clearly. The admonition has been direct, it's been clear, it's been lucid. He has been so methodical in his approach, he's calculating. The message is clear. I believe I believe that everybody who has come here even once in the past few days has been blessed in a very special way. Seeds have been sown, those seeds will germinate, they will yield their fruits in their season. Babies have been born. And those babies will blossom, they will flourish in Jesus' name. I, I, I had to think that tomorrow morning we, do, we will not be gathered here like this. I, but everything that has a beginning comes to an end. Uh, the joy of it is that we have heard the message loud and clear. But this morning, we are here for the concluding session. And it is my great pleasure to invite the man of God. Uh, he, will, he will speak the, in his usual style, speak the message. He is the convener of the Global Crusade with Kumuye. He is the general superintendent of the Deeper Christian Life Ministry. He is pastor, Dr. W.F. Kumuye. Thank you, Apostle. It's my pleasure to welcome you. Well, praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Great, glorious morning, everyone. As our morning is good, our ministry will be good. And as every morning we wake up and we say this, the day the Lord has made, I'll be glad and rejoice in it. Great morning, great ministry. We depend upon the grace of God. And you know, sometimes some people cannot even wake up because, uh, you know, they had that in the night and that in the night but you know for us the grace of God comes even when your body is saying am I getting up the grace comes and lifts you up yeah. and you have a gracious morning a gracious ministry yeah. you know every moment the Lord is with us as we're here he is with us and as we're finishing, uh, we're concluding today and we're going out every step of your way, every day of your week, every month of your year, the Lord will be with you. And you carry those words with you, good, great, gracious. Amen. Father, we thank you. I will magnify you because of your love, because of your ministers. These are your ambassadors. And you have come here, we have come here, and you have come with us. And so that will be equipped for the ministry. We pray, Lord, everything we still need, you pass on to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Make our ministries good, Amen. great, Amen. glorious gracious in Jesus name thank you because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray God has blessed you you can sit down today we're coming to the conclusion 
of the Ministers and Professionals Conference. And today we're looking at the explicit mandate of ministering faith till the end. Explicit. There's no shadow of doubt. What he wants us to do, what he has called us to do, and what he has anointed, appointed for us to do is very clear, explicit. It's a mandate. It's a decree. It's a word we cannot turn upside down. It's a word we cannot take anything from. It's a word he has given us, and it's a mandate. And when we go to the field, we're not going and asking the people, what do you want me to tell you? What do you want me to teach you? No, we already have the mandate. We have the mandate from Christ, the commandment from Christ, the great commission from Christ, and it is explicit enough of ministering. We're not there to talk anything, say any other thing. We're there as ministers. Am I right? And when the driver drives, and the minister must minister. And the one who has been sent by the Lord were to represent the Lord. We're not representing a tribe. We're not representing a locality. We're not representing a denomination. We are there to represent the Lord. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the King of kings and the Lord of laws. He is the Redeemer. And he sends us forth to represent him. They're like the ambassadors of a country that go to the country. And they're representing their country. Whatever the culture of that country, they don't follow that culture. And whatever, when those countries, when they have their holidays, they said it's their holiday, the ambassador represents his own country. The ambassador of Christ represents Christ. He doesn't represent this, um, you know, denomination, that denomination. I come here, well, it's good, you know, somebody must have a name, somebody must have an address is coming from, a locality is coming from. Uh, they say you are from a Kenwa Road or something. Well, but you are not a Kenwa because, you know, that, that's the location. They say you are coming from deeper life. They say the general superintendent of this and that, that's all right. We have to introduce somebody and give a name, but I didn't come here in the name of deeper life. I came to represent Christ and I came to tell you the mandate that he has given. The explicit mandate of ministering faith. We're ministering faith. We don't minister doubt. Some people read the Bible and they say, Peter said, uh, is it Peter that said, the Holy Ghost inspired Peter to say that God said. When the Bible says something, it's God saying that. And if they say what Solomon said, well, I understand. But it's God that gave the word and the wisdom to Solomon. It's God. And we build up faith in God. And that's the reason why we're here. From the beginning of our ministry to the very end, we're ministering faith. And it says, till the end. I will go on till the end. I will go on till the end. I'm sure you've heard. They asked me the question and they said, are you about to retire? I said, retire. I'm going till the end. Somebody there, I'm going till the end. You know, in the different religious circles, they have their own principles, they have their own tradition, and they have their own uh, administration. And they will tell you, now you have reached this age, now you retire. Now, that's your denomination, that's your administration. If you're an evangelist, at that time, uh, when they say you retire, the Lord does not take away from you the ministry of the evangelist. You retire denominationally, but you go on firing on until the end. They bring 
you know, all those things, that's what they did, they, they do in the world. You know, they, they say that at this age, at 65, at 70, you retire, get out of that seat. Somebody is waiting already, and if you don't live there, they will push you out because the next person must be there. That's why they retire. It comes to their turn. But in the case of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, look at Peter there until the end. Look at Paul there until the end. Look at Timothy there until the end. And I look at you today, and I pray that a fresh anointing will come upon your life. A new power will come upon your life. Hey, don't, 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 maybe you're sitting down now. You know, sometimes we'll stand up, sometimes we'll stand, just like I'm standing now and you're sitting down. But your sitting down is preparation for launching out. You will go on till the end in Jesus' name. The topic today, the explicit man uh, mandate of ministering faith till the end. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 10 and we're looking at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water. Look at verse 23. In verse 23 it says let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. It says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Our faith. Why? Because he who has called you and he who has appointed you is faithful that promise. Join those two words together. Our faith is faithfulness. What is faith? Faith is believing that God is faithful. As he promised, he'll fulfill it. As he giving you an assignment, he will make sure you carry out the assignment. Our faith is in the faithfulness of God. Man's faith in the faithfulness of God. Think about that. Think about that. A sinner is coming are you going to be saved? Yes, I'll be saved. Why? I have faith in the faithfulness of the Savior. If, if a sick person is coming, do you believe you are going to be healed? Yes. Why? I have faith in the faithfulness of the healer. Here is a downtrodden person and uh, he is a slave to everything. But he calls for redemption, my friend. Do you believe you are going to be redeemed? Yes, I have faith in the faithfulness of the redeemer. He wonder, are you, why are you here? Because this is my way to get to heaven. How do you believe you are going to get to heaven? I have faith in the faithfulness of the one who has made a mansion for me over there. Faith and faithfulness. Anytime you come to the Lord, you understand, he will answer my prayer. He'll give me joy. He'll give me peace. He will turn my life around for the better. Why? Because I have faith in the faithfulness of him who has promised. And that's why we're here today. I just want to remind you that we have this explicit uh, mandate. We have the faith. We give the faith. We believe in the Lord and we call other people to they believe on the Lord and we're doing that every day. We never operate in unbelief. We never operate in fear. We never operate in faithfulness. We never operate in faltering and we're shaking. We cannot shake. Why? Because the one who is faithful is so firm, is so solid and we know that all the powers on earth are not equal to the power of the faithful one who has called you. And he will see you through. There are three things we're going to look at. Number one, we're looking at the preaching and profession of faith in the faithful. Number two, we're looking at the pattern and proclamation of faith 
in its fullness. We, we don't only, you know, talk about faith in a, you know, in a little sector, section of the word of God. In the fullness of the word of God, what he has promised he will do in its fullness. We have faith in that and we look at the pattern, we look at the proclamation. Number three is our perseverance and in possession of faith in the finisher, in the finisher. You know, some people say, I am now, I believe in the Lord. How am I going to finish well? Faith in the finisher. The author and the finisher of our faith. He is the author, he is the origin. He has started something good in your life. He will continue. There's no fear. Maybe there'll be an obstacle in the way. Maybe there'll be a hurdle in the way and something will stop me. Uh-uh. You're unstoppable. Yeah. If he is unstoppable, you are unstoppable. Yeah. If he is the one that started the faith in you, you know, unfinished product, men have unfinished product. They start this, they cannot finish. They start that, they cannot finish, but not Christ. He has started with your life. He's molding you. He's mending you. He's mentoring you. And what he has started, he will finish. Maybe today you are an unfinished product. There's no problem because he's still working on you. I said, the Lord is still working on you. Yeah. Somebody looks at you and he says, uh-uh, madam, uh-uh, sir, that's how you are. You need to see me about 10 years ago. I'm not what I used to be. Say that to yourself. <laughs> and the Lord is still at work. He has not finished. And you can go away, and when he finishes, you can come back. You'll see something you never saw in your life before. Yeah. He's on walking, he's walking in your life, and he has started, and he will, he will finish strong. He will finish well. And when I look at you after he has walked on you, I'll be surprised. This brother so and so, that sister so and so, that's minita so and so, and You'll be a wonder to the people around you in Jesus' name. We're looking at number two. Number two, uh, sorry, number one is the preaching and the profession of faith in the faithful. Faith in the faithful. It tells us uh, we're going to divide this to three parts. Number one, we're looking at the profession with full assurance of faith. Number two is the preaching by faithful ambassadors of the foundation. Number three is the foundation for fatal abandonment of the faith. Fatal abandonment of the faith. You may not abandon the ministry, but if you abandon the faith for the ministry, fatal. You may not abandon, you know, worship and coming every Sunday and doing this and that. But if you abandon the faith in the worship that is fatal, you will not abandon. And God will not abandon you. Look at number one. Number one is the profession with full assurance of faith. It tells us in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, I'm reading there from verse 7, then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Christ came uh, to do the will of God. My salvation is the will of God. That's what he came to do. My healing is the will of God. That's what he came to do. My growth is the will of God. That's what he came to do. My perfection is the will of God. That is what he came to do. And he will do it well in your life. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it tells us, Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not neither art thou pleasure therein which are offered by the law neither do you have a pleasure in what was offered 
by the law. By the law. That's the Old Testament. And you see all those uh, people in the Old Testament, they're bringing this sacrifice, bringing that sacrifice, and it didn't touch them. It didn't purify them. It didn't make their lives better. And God says, yes, I ordained it, but it's not producing the result. I don't have pleasure in that anymore. Uh, you know, religion. There are people that they do not read the whole Bible. Uh, you understand? Whenever you buy a book, many people, when you read your bo the book you have bought, you start from chapter 1. If you get to the middle of that chapter 2, you have tried. They don't go to the end of the book. How many books have you got? How many books have you started reading? And you read chapter 1, chapter 2, and then uh, you put it on the shelf. And now one year has gone, you have not touched that book. There are many people, they come to religion, they read Genesis and Exodus, and they cannot go beyond that. They read the Leviticus, they cannot go beyond that. When you go on reading, and go on reading, and you come to this, and it says all those Old Testament, uh, all the Old, Old Testament uh, sacrifices, he has no pleasure in them. And then in verse 9, in verse 9, it tells us, Then said I, lo, I come. To do thy will, O God. I come, he came to the earth. He came over here on earth. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. And, uh, you know, when he came, there were people that have not understood. Uh, the Pharisees did not understand. Sadducees did not understand. Religious leaders in Israel did not understand. Nicodemus did not understand. Are you a ruler in Israel and you don't understand? And the leper did not understand. That's why the leper said, if it be thy will, you can make me whole. You can cleanse me. There are people that take their prayer pattern from the leper. The leper that did not know that he has come. He came to save. He came to heal. He came to deliver. And when they want to pray, they come and chapter 8 of Matthew where the leper said if it be the will is so far away from Calvary Chapter 8 is so far away from the cross. It's so far away from the time Jesus said, it is finished. And, you know, they still pray like, you know, that leper, if it be the will, save me. Of course, he came to do the will of God. If it be the will, heal me. Of course, he came to do the will of God. If it be the will, sanctify me. Sanctification is the will of God. And Jesus said, Lo, behold, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. He taketh away the first. What's that? The first covenant, the old covenant. All those sacrifices bring goat and bring sheep and bring fowl and bring turtle dove and bring this and that. He take it away the first so that he can establish the second. He take it away the first. All the activities of the first Adam that he did and brought us into sin, into slavery, into sickness, into satanic dominion. He taketh away the first and now the second, the last Adam. He has come and what he has now given us is good salvation, total salvation, is perfect salvation, wonderful salvation and total healing and total deliverance. He has given you now. And in your life, you not go back to the first, the first sacrifice. There's the second sacrifice. There's the final sacrifice. You're not going back to the old covenant. You're now in the new covenant. And it says he has now established the second. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, by the which will. I come to do thy will, O God. By that will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. Once for all. Some religious people, they say, whenever they take the sacrament, 
whenever they take the Holy Communion, they say that they are having the sacrifice of Jesus again. And they are taking of the literal body and the literal blood of Jesus again. No, no. Because he gave the sacrifice and the offering once for all. That's why many people are deceived because um, they want uh, healing, they want deliverance, and they come to the prophet, the prophet who has not come into the New Testament, and they say, prophet, prophet, I want to wash away all my demon, all my, you know, the, the, the destruction, and they say, come. And they say, they follow them to the riverside, and Mr. Prophet, a man, is uh, washing by himself, is washing uh, Madame Sickness uh, at the river. No wonder they commit sin or the outcome. Even David that did not see was not washing Bathsheba. Just look outside the window and saw Bathsheba washing herself committed adultery and murder. How about the Mr. Prophet that takes the woman and undresses the woman and is washing the woman at the riverside? Those are not prophets of God. They're still back. In, even in the old covenant, they didn't do that, to wash a woman by the riverside. I'm sure you will not do that. But the sacrifice of Christ, once for all, it has now been totally done, and it is by that we are sanctified. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, for by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified by one offering. He did that on the cross, and no more. But now we are made Perfect through that sanctification. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, verse 16, what did he say? This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. Give me a good amen. amen. People have, um, you know, the Ten Commandments and they put it on the wall. But you are not looking at that every time. And then you go out, you cannot see that. They put uh, the Ten Commandments, you know, it's very beautifully printed. And they put it there, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And uh, when they go out, they're not seeing that thing on the wall. The thing that the wall uh, paper said, thou shalt not, they do. But God said it's not effective to put those laws and those commandments on the wall, on the door, anywhere. But now I will put my laws into their heart. And you carry that with you everywhere. And the reader, your conscience is reminding you, look at this law, look at this law. And you cannot say, I forgot, because it's written upon your heart. And in their minds, will I write them. It's a new day. It's a new dispensation. It's a new covenant. And the Lord effected your life in Jesus' name. We're coming to we're coming to number two here. Number two is the preaching by faithful ambassadors of the foundation. The preaching by faithful ambassadors of the foundation. It says we're preaching the foundation. We're preaching the founder. We're preaching the finisher of our faith. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, looking at verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me. Hold on. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me. At salvation, it's by grace. The rest of our lives in the ministry is also by grace. By grace. God, God's riches, abundant, and complete, and is extensive, given unto us. At salvation, grace. At sanctification, grace. In service, grace. 
their people in service, they live the grace of God, and they minister in the energy of the flesh. They minister in the uh, attitude of the flesh. They live the grace of God apart and with a physical, natural uh, attitude, they minister and it doesn't work. And they so labor without grace. And the labor is a graceless labor. And the activity is a graceless activity. Now, grace will not be angry at the congregation. Grace will not be angry at the backslider. Grace will not fight on the pulpit. Grace will not knock, will not knock somebody there where you're preaching. When we're saved, it's all by grace. And when we're sanctified, it's all by grace. And as we come to serve the Lord in any capacity, there's no pride in grace. And there is no anger in grace. There's no self-will in grace. There's no browbeating, beating other people to submission by grace. Grace does not do that. Here Paul the Apostle said, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. Grace makes us wise. Self makes us unwise foolish, personal ability, and the personal aggressiveness. It makes us foolish, but it's the grace that makes us, like it made Paul, a wise master builder. He said, I have laid the foundation, another builders thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. How is he going to take heed by grace. Our forerunners, the ones who went before us, they did it all by grace. And Christ came to reveal grace unto us and the fullness of grace. As we're built thereupon, we're building in by the grace of God. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, for all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. When you are building the foundation, the foundation is Jesus Christ. And you're preaching the, in the faithfulness of the foundation. Uh, you're not uh, replacing Christ with yourself. Listen to me. This is who I am. This, my church, is <laughs> gone astray. In the church of Jesus Christ. And it says, upon this rock I'll build my church. And when you are in grace, you understand this is his church. And we handle that delicately. And we handle that wisely. And we handle that as representatives of Christ. And we're still building that same foundation Christ. And we don't allow our gifts, our talents, our popularity to carry us away. And now we're talking about myself, myself. For the foundation can no man lay than that which is laid already, which is Jesus Christ. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, now, if any man build upon this foundation, how is he going to build upon the foundation? Is doing it by grace. I, I'm not qualified for this. This is not my family property. I'm not qualified to handle this. I am here as I was saved by grace. I also serve by grace. And the Lord will be happy with such a person. And every grace we need and every strength we need, every power we need, he'll give unto us in Jesus' name. But you know, in the church, when the people fear the man, the minister, more than uh, they fear God, they love Christ, and more than they yielded to the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, 
There's no more grace there. Uh, that man is the authority, is the power. And what, once they stand, just look at him standing alone. You begin to tremble. And once he looks at you and he says whatever he says and whatever he's used to say, the people fear him. Uh, they don't say, don't do that because the grace of Christ forbids us to do that. They say, don't do that. If the pastor hears you did that, you are in trouble. We don't, you will never get in trouble with Christ. We will never get in trouble with the grace of God when joy is smile, when joy is love. But the man or the woman that wants to keep us in slavery, whatever they do, and their posture is like we tremble and we fear them. There's no church there. There's no ministry there. It's the grace of God that helps us and we build precious things like gold and silver and precious stone. Those who build wood, hay and stubble that will be burnt up because they do it without grace. We will have the grace of God. I will have the grace of God. Anytime you come to minister and you see that Grace is leaked out. The grace is not there. The goodness of the Lord is not there. The riches of the kingdom, not there. The abundance of the kingdom is not there. And the cross of Christ is not there. And the emancipation of the Lord by the Lord alone, and you have the joy in presenting Emmanuel, the emancipator before them. If all that is not there, why don't you just go back to your closet? Why don't you go back uh, to your chamber and say, Lord, I need grace. I cannot minister to these people in anger. I cannot minister with boisterousness. I cannot minister with that hard kind of, you know, word I'm speaking to them, I need grace. He'll give you more grace. And that grace will be sufficient for you in Jesus' name. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading there from verse 19, foundation, foundation. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. We're building a on the foundation. The ambassadors of Christ are to build on the foundation. And it says, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, when it's by grace, it's easy to depart from iniquity. The grace of God lifts you up and helps you and he says, get up. This is not your place. You are better than this. You are higher than this. And the grace comes, you'll depart from iniquity. Yeah. But when you leave the grace of God alone and you're doing it by yourself, I will not do this. I will not say this. I will not go there. I will not move there. When it's by your strength, it's difficult, difficult to break the habit that had been with you for 30, 40, 50 years or more. But when it is by grace, everyone that names the name of Christ can easily depart from iniquity. And somebody shout, Amen. Amen. We're looking at number three here. Number three in the perdition for fatal abandonment of the faith. The perdition for fatal abandonment of faith. Uh, you see, there are people that uh, think that I'm saved, I'm forever saved. That's condition there. If you abide, you're saved, forever saved. If you remain, you're saved, forever saved. But you know, we have our free will, a free will. And that free will operates every time. Do you understand? I breathe in, breathe out. That's my free will. If I don't want to breathe, I know how to do that. Everybody knows how to do that. But we we'll breathe in, we we'll breathe out because we have 
free will. You take your birth in the morning. Nobody comes to force you. It's your free will. You eat when you're hungry. You might decide I won't eat even though I'm hungry. But your free will makes you to decide, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to eat. And you dress yourself well before you go out of the house. It's your free will. If you don't want to dress, if you want to put on whatever, that uh, people will see the anatomy of your body. It's your free will. And the same thing, the grace of God has come unto us. The grace of God and salvation was not forced on us. Whosoever will may come. And the strength of salvation was not forced on us. We came, he said, be strong in the Lord. And we decided I'm going to be strong in the Lord. A free will is there. And then if anybody wants to sin, the free will is there too. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, it's a will. After that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. You understand that? If, you know, the food is there, and then mommy says, come and eat, and for whatever reason may be, you are angry at her, and you are angry at yourself, and you say, I will not eat your food. And then you take that place of food and you throw it away. That's your free will. And you did that willfully. Now when you are hungry, you cannot say, Mommy, can I have food? I'm out of the kitchen already. And the one I give you, you throw it away. You see, the same thing. It, de it delivers us from sin. He saves us from sin. And if we decide that that sacrifice, we're going to rubbish that sacrifice. If we decide we're not going to take the benefit of that sacrifice anymore, if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Look at the next uh, verse there, 27. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment. Now you are the one looking for the judgment. He doesn't want to judge you. He doesn't want to condemn you. He wants you happy. He wants you holy. He wants you moving forward. But you said, no, I'm grounded. You're grounded yourself. No, I'm going to continue seeing uh, that's your decision. And you're looking for judgment. He has not come to condemn. He has not come to judge. He has come to save. But you see, I'm looking for that judgment. All right, what you are looking for, you will get. Ask and thou shalt receive. Seek and ye shall find. Nor can it shall be opened unto you. But a certain fear for looking for of judgment and fairy indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now, it's reserved for the adversaries. The Lord, in his own mind, he makes you an ambassador. He makes you a child of God. He makes you his offering. But you say, no, I abandon that. I want to fight. I want to fight. All right. But understand, when you make yourself an adversary of the Lord, that's your choice. That's judgment. This fairy indignation, verse 28. In verse 28, he that despises Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Verse 29, how of how much sorrow punishment. Suppose ye that he, he shall he be thought worthy who has trodden on the foot, the son of God. You see that? That's not the will of God. That somebody who has been a believer is coming and now something got into him and he accepted that thing. Not Satan. Because if it's Satan that does something through you, God will punish that Satan. And if it's not your fault, it's not my fault, it's Satan. God will handle Satan only look for because this is man's choice. And he has trodden underfoot 
the son of God. How do you tread somebody under your foot? He's standing before you. He's pleading, I died for you. He's pleading, I died so that your sins will be taken away. He said, get out of my sight. I am your savior. I am Jesus. I'm the son of God. And you push him down and you walk over him. You have trampled on the foot the son of God. Because you love your sin. And you love what you want to do more than the son of God standing before you. Look at this. And he has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. He was sanctified. He was saved, he was set apart, he was sanctified, he was made holy by the blood of the covenant. But now, he counts that blood. Look at that. Look at that. It says, wherewith he was uh, sanctified and an unholy thing. He counts that as an unholy. But you said the blood was holy before. Yes, I said so before. I don't say that again. I don't accept that again. That the man is choosing. That he is going to abandon the faith. And abandon the grace of God. And I am surprised. The people who hear him say what he says. And see him do what he does. They are still giving the respect of the old faithfulness. When he was standing, when he believed in Christ, when he was following Christ, they're still saying, brother, brother. They're still saying, reverend, reverend. And they're still saying, uh, pastor, pastor. Look at what he has done. He's trodden under the Son of God. And he has uh, counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. And he has done despite to the spirit of grace. And, you know, did he still use all this title? And he still say, you know, brother, he still say, sister, look at him, look at her. And look at even his facial appearance. And look at his defiance. He gazed the Lord Jesus and he gave the spirit of God. Look at verse 30. In verse 30 it says for we know him that has said vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense says the Lord and again the Lord shall judge his people. And we look at verse 31 there. Verse 31 it's a fearful thing to fall to the hands of the living God. Look at verse 38. In verse 38 it says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, you know, the free will is there. You become saved, your free will is still there. You're sanctified, your free will is still there. You become a minister, your free will is still there. And you become, you know, the highest of the ministers in your denomination, your free will is still there. And we need to subdue that free will. No, I will not do that. I'm a child of God, I will not go that direction. Make sure that your free will does not not ruin your life now. The just shall lay by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. It's when we stand on the ground of grace, and when we stand by the virtue of faith, he has pleasure in us, but it's not forever. If we draw back, then it says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Look at verse 39. Verse 39, it says, but we are not of them who draw back. I didn't hear you. Amen. It's a personal choice. Personal choice. We, we know the path back to the dregs of the world, to the defilement of the world, but we say, no, I am not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. You'll keep on believing. I believed yesterday, today I believe. I said today I believe. The water I drank yesterday 
is not enough to quench the thirst of today. The food I ate yesterday is not enough to assuage and temper and remove the hunger I feel today. The faith I had yesterday is not enough to overcome the challenges of today. Every day I must believe. That's why it says we're not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Amen in your life. Amen. We come to point number two. Point number two, the pattern and proclamation of faith in its fullness. We're looking at three things here. Number one, pleasing God through the obedience of faith. Number two, proclaiming the gospel for observance by the faithful. Number three, it says preventing the giants of the obstacles of fear. Look at number one. Number one is pleasing God through the obedience of faith. We're looking at um, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5, by faith Enoch 